Okay. We are proud to welcome Roger Earl from Foghat. How are you today, Roger? I'm doing fine. I'm rocking and rolling. Uh, went fishing yesterday. Going to try and do a little bit this afternoon, but we'll see. Uh, <laughs> Well, it's been very kind to me. It's been an amazing ride. Uh, take us back to the early days. I know, I know, growing up here in uh, Jerry Lee Lewis and Great Balls of Fire and that American Rock and Roll really did it for you. Tell us about, you know, that inspiration. You falling in love and starting to play drums. Yeah, uh, actually, the first real concert I went to, my father took me in uh, nineteen sixty or sixty one to see Jerry Lee Lewis. I was. Uh, 12 or 13, about 13, I think. And uh, my father played piano. My older brother, Colin, plays piano. He played in a band called Mungo Jerry. They had a bunch of hits. Sure. And uh, I wanted to play piano, but I wasn't getting a look in anywhere. So anyway, when I saw Jerry Lee, he brought his drummer over from the States. This guy was fantastic. I think it was Jim Tabrent or something like that. And uh, he was fantastic. And that was it. I've never been the same since. <laughs> you got the bug early on. Yeah, I got the bug, and then, of course, then the little Richard probably had uh, was one of the greatest voices around. Certainly had one of the best uh, bands ever. Fantastic drummer and uh, uh, Chuck Berry. I mean, where would we be without Chuck? There would be no rock and roll without Chuck. Certainly no Rolling Stones, anyway. Yeah. Uh, well, you you know it's amazing that Jerry Lee Lewis and Little Richard and Chuck Berry are still alive. Why why is it so important for us to show the love to these pioneers while they're still on the planet? Yeah, um, I thought I was going to go see Jerry Lee uh, this year. I'm good friends with Chubby Checker. I just saw uh, Chubby a week ago here in Bakersfield. He was great. Amazing. Yeah, a beautiful man. And uh, actually, we got up and played with him. Uh, down in Nashville, and uh, he was fantastic. We got up and uh, rocked the twist. Oh, Chuck. yeah, he, he got in the audience and did the twist with at least 100 people. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, but, but, yeah, these guys are still alive. That's part of history. When when they're passed, I mean, that that's an era closed. So, right. you know, it's, it's very important for us to let them know why they're still here, how much they mean to all of us. Yeah, and also, also like, where, you know, where this music came from. I mean, without... Uh, those people, uh, you know, it wouldn't be there. Alan Freed uh, claims that he was a DJ, claims that he was, uh, he coined the word rock and roll, but I have a feeling it was somebody down south. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think there's a black gentleman not getting credit for that somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, now tell us about, you know, meeting Lonesome Dave and, and playing in Savoy Brown and what it was, what, what, what was it about you two playing together that you later would form Fog Yacht? Um, uh, 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 I auditioned for Soy Savoy Brown. Dave had already been in the band about two, two or three months, and uh, I was auditioning with a friend of mine, a bass player friend, and uh, we didn't get the job because uh, they were looking for a bass player and drummer. I think they thought that we were together. Well, we were kind of, but uh, then they caught. Then they got a drummer. Then they called me up two weeks later and said, uh, "You want to come and try again?" And I believe it was Dave who suggested that, you know, maybe I could do the gig anyway. I uh, I turned up again. I was a commercial artist at the time, and I was working in London. So I borrowed my father's car, put the drums in there, and uh, I went down to his place with the nags head, went upstairs, played for about, I don't know, a couple of hours with them. I started packing up the drums because I was going to go back to work. They, you know, took the lunch hour or two hours off for lunch. They said... Where are you going? I said, uh, I'm going back to work. And they said, well, we got a big, we got a gig in Birmingham tonight. So uh, that's what started it. <laughs> <laughs> quit, quit, quit the day job right there. And, uh, and, and no, what was it about you and Dave that, that clicked so much that you eventually wanted to form, you know, the band? Uh, actually, Dave and I used to, uh, we didn't know each other before that, but we used to go to all the same shows. I uh, like to see Jerry Lee or... Uh, Little Richard or Chuck Berry, and we uh, we talked about it later on in life. Um, we had a very similar taste in music. Lonesome Dave um, had a fantastic record collection and had great knowledge of all things blues, rock and roll, jazz, and gospel as well. Um, uh, he was also, I think, he was a closet drummer. 
he knew all, he knew all the drummers that played in all the bands. So, uh, but fortunately for me, he played guitar and sang. So, I took the drum seat. So, what, what, what was it like that day when you knew that uh, you were going to leave the band and, and form Foghat and get Tony Stevens and Rod Price and, and, and build this thing up? Uh, we were in um, San Francisco, and uh, I think Kim had just got a new record deal. We were just like paid side men. We were uh, getting like sixty bucks a week, and um, whether we played or not, well, yeah. we, played, we played all the time. And they were getting about ten to fifteen grand a night, so we thought it, maybe it was time for a change. Um, uh, Kim was fine about it. Um, uh, they fired Tony Stevens and asked Dave and I to stay, but we said, look, we'll play until, you know, you find somebody to replace us, and uh, it's time for a change. Um, I've stayed good friends with Kim over the years. I've also got up and I jammed with him a few times. Um, I played on one of his records on three or four songs. Um, Kim is a fantastic guitar player. He's probably better uh, than ever now, and, uh, and a good friend. We get on real well. That's great. So, I mean, from the first album on, the Willie Dixon song, I Just Want to Make Love to You, became a staple, especially here in America, you know, on Freeform FM radio. What what was it like to feel that acceptance right off the bat with a with a great song and, uh, you know, uh, uh, an open country here in America that really embraced you? Well, um, it didn't happen overnight. Um, uh, we couldn't get arrested in England. Um Savoy Brown's manager uh, told us that we'd never work again in England because I, when Tony Stevens got fired, Dave and I left. And true to his word, he stopped us from working there. Um, our manager uh, was a friend of mine at the time, Tony Otida, and uh, he became our manager. And he knew Albert Grossman, who was starting uh, a record company um, distributed by uh, Warner Brothers. And... Um, we were uh, writing and doing some rehearsing and stuff. Anyway, uh, Albert Grossman was um, the president of Bearsville Records, and he was coming over to uh, England. He managed uh, the band, uh, Janis Joplin, uh, Peter, Paul and Mary, uh, a number of other uh, terrific acts. And he came to see us. He rented this little uh, club up in Easington in North London, very near... Uh, are you into football at all? Soft. Yes, yes. Uh, it was near the old Arsenal Stadium in Highbury. Anyway, uh, we went there. We rented it in the afternoon. A tiny little club. It was just us, the band. And Albert came down, Albert Grossman, and he sat about 12 feet in front of the stage, which probably wasn't all that bright. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, we, we lit up with our uh, martial amps. And, yeah. Um, he visibly sort of took a step backwards. <laughs> uh, we played about seven or eight songs for him. And then Albert Grossman said, um, is there anywhere we can go get some tea and biscuits? I said, yeah. There's a, there's a hotel across the road where they serve tea and biscuits. And uh, we went over there. Um, Albert ordered tea and biscuits all round. And we were sitting there. Albert was a very cool guy, big, long, silver hair, ponytail. Yeah. And, uh, I, mean, I mean, I knew who he was. I mean, this is the man who, who managed Bob Dylan and the band. So right. uh, you, you knew he was a heavy hitter. So uh, the tea and biscuits arrived. We were just sitting around the table, and he says, well, okay, uh, let's do it. <laughs> and to this day, it still gives me chills saying that. Um he sent us uh, 10 grand over to sort of start recording and um, we worked with Todd Rundgren on the first album a uh, number of other people Dave Edmonds uh, produced the first record for us and did a fantastic job in fact I don't think it would have been anywhere near as good as it was uh, without Dave and uh, I Just Want to Make Love to You was one of the songs we've been playing or actually jamming when we were in Savoy Brown Dave and I and Tony Stevens would jam it at sound checks, and then when Rod joined us, um, it became something else. Well, it was certainly a, a a great start here in America. Nothing happens overnight, but you guys have 
had an incredible run, and and I know that song is still a staple today. Yeah. And of course, with the rock and roll album and Energize and Rock and Roll Outlaws, you guys really started to build build the catalog, chip away, but full for the city. I mean, what an album! Um, talk about you know the making of that record. What what you feel was you know within the band or the climate that really helped create Slow Ride and some of your you know all time classic you know material but that was um after uh Tony uh Stevens had left the band got fired again um <laughs> and Nick Jameson who'd been our long time producer and good friend was playing bass on the Pump of the City album and, and producing it and uh it was the first time since the first album that we actually took some time off the road um, we took about two or three months off the road. Uh, we found a studio up in Sharon, Vermont, and uh, Nick and I took a station wagon up there, some guitars and drums and bass, and banged around in this room, and it worked. Um, so right came from a jam. Rod and I, Rod Price and myself, had uh, a house out here on Long Island at the time, and we uh, we were jamming in the basement. And in fact, uh, so right, it was actually written by everybody, and we finished actually from the jam with basically the same arrangement that we did on the record. And uh, Dave said, uh, I, th- "I think I've got some words for that one." <laughs> and Paul for the City again was like really down to Nick Jameson, our producer. Um, he arranged it. I think Dave and Rod wrote the lyrics and uh, the chord structure and melody, but um, Nick Jameson arranged the song. Uh, Nick, he's a genius to this. I think yeah. he moved to uh, Iceland. Wow. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> he likes it there anyway. Sure. I like it here. Well, yeah, such a, such an iconic album. And, and, and tell us the concept for the cover with the... Uh, with with the fishing through the uh, the manhole in the city, hey, it was in uh, Manhattan. Um, we went in early one Sunday morning, and uh, I think it was again it was Nick Jameson's idea, I think, to do this. And um, we pulled a manhole cover up and uh, started taking pictures. Then a couple of New York finest came along in their car and said, "Hey, what are you doing?" You got a license? And we all went, oh, shit. <laughs> they said, you got a fishing license? <laughs> and they started, they came around and said, what are you doing here? And we explained to them who we were and what we were doing. So they joined in for a while. They had to cover their badges. Uh, actually, New York cops are the best. They're really uh, cool. Uh, they're more worried about murders and rapes and all that sort of horror show than uh, yeah. what they're, they're, they're not worried with a little bending of the rules. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun, actually. Sure. Well, that that was a great time. Matter of fact, uh, I don't know if you remember, but I just moved back. I traveled the world, and I just come back from South America. And I, uh, in Ohio, went to a concert up in northern Ohio. This is the summer of 76. You guys were in full blast with Fool for the City. And you guys headlined a big outdoor festival with Ted Nugent and Bob Seger and Head East and, and, and so many big, big bands. But it was right in the middle of, like, Cleveland and Chicago and Detroit. And I don't know if you remember that show, but it it, it was an amazing event in my life. Thank you. Yeah, uh, actually, we did a lot of shows with Bob Seger, great band. Um, I ended up becoming real good friends with uh, Alto Reed, his sax player. Yeah. Um, uh, <clears throat> and Ted, uh we know Ted very well. We've done a number of shows with him over the years. Sure. Crazy bastard. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> he's not everybody's cup of tea. Yes. But, um, Either love him or hate him. Yeah, yeah. He, he can play. He plays great. And um, uh, of course, Charlie Hune, our singer, yeah. uh, probably sang with on some of Ted's best stuff. Sure. Um, I'm also good friends with uh, Derek St. Holmes. Yeah. Who. Obviously, sang with Ted originally. In fact, I did an album with um, 
Derek called uh, was it Daniel Wentworth, who was a guitar player. Um, yeah, uh, Ted had uh, always had a good singer in his band. Absolutely, it was a, gr- a great time, and then of course that led into Night Shift. You guys had uh, an incredible run there, Stone Blue, and of course the live album. The live album in '77 has become your your biggest seller. Um, why, why do you think that is? Is it just people that just love to recreate that, that experience of the live show? Um, well, at the time, uh, Craig McGregor had uh, just joined us, and I think Rod and Dave were having like kind of a, a riot at Brock, uh, and the band was doing really, really well. And I would listen to um, the, the uh, set, each evening, our, our uh, front of house engineer, Bob Coffey, who I'm still good friends with, would record them and put them on cassettes. Mm-hmm. Anybody remember cassettes mm-hmm. out there? Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, so, you know, just to make sure that the tempos were right, and, you know, we got our act together, and uh, they were sounding really good. So I suggested uh, to everybody and our manager that maybe we should do a live album. Now, originally, it was going to be a double live album because we were playing for about an hour and a half two hours each night. Mm-hmm. But Warner Brothers, the parent company, said, nah, live albums don't sell. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, if you look at the cover, the uh, live album, it's a double cover. So, but they decided not to uh, do that. In fact, I was uh, Warner Brothers with their manager uh, about a month ago, and they're going to see if they, because we did, a, there was another five or six songs in there. Mm. And they're going to uh, see if they can find them and release them. I think uh, Chateau Lafitte, 59 Boogie, um, uh, Maybelline, a bunch of other songs. So that would be fun. In fact, and we found uh, in the ar- in the archives of Warner Brothers in 1974, we did a live radio show down in uh, Texas. And they're thinking of releasing that. I listened to it and it's really good. Great, great stuff. Now, I also know that in 77, you did the big tribute to the blues at the New York Palladium with Eddie Kirkland and all that. I know it was a special yeah. night for you. T- tell us about that event and what that meant for you. Um, actually, I think it might that might have been Dave's initial uh, idea, because Dave was very knowledgeable about all things blues, and, uh, you know, the band was really uh, doing really well so everybody else got paid except us we had uh, Muddy Waters John Lee Hooker uh, Paul Butterfield Eddie Bluesman Kirkland uh, Pine Top Perkins on piano Johnny Winter uh, yeah I, I've often said it but it was it was a musical highlight of my life um, my parents were there it was my father's wow 60th birthday that week, I believe. So I brought them over from England, and uh, it was it was really cool for my parents to sort of see me playing uh, with all my childhood musical heroes. And sure. uh, it was it was yeah, it was something. Um, Muddy was just beautiful. John Lee Hooker was incredible. Eddie Kirkland was just this fantastic guitar player, singer, and well, I used to do acrobats back then. Uh, mm. I knew Paul Butterfield from when I uh, lived up in Bearsville, uh, in Woodstock, um, fantastic harp player and singer. Um, and Johnny, I've done loads of shows with Johnny. He was uh, he was a fantastic blues man and uh, a real, real character. <laughs> sure. I can tell you some stories, but I know we're on... Uh, yes. Some young- well, you, you know, it's an amazing uh, collaboration between the U.K. and the U.S. over the years. You guys were influenced by these great players and the music that you guys made and the Stones and the Led Zeppelins and everybody influenced us. You know, it's been a beautiful relationship with music going back and forth over the Atlantic. You know, what, uh, what, what makes that so special that we keep inspiring each other to greater heights? Uh, well... All is forgiven, right? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, uh, you know, America gave music to the world. Uh, jazz, blues, rock and roll, gospel. Uh, I mean, just about all contemporary music. 
uh, has been influenced by American music. Um, you know, it transcends uh, barriers, language barriers. Uh, I mean, the blues and jazz is very popular in, say, uh, in, in Japan, and, uh, China, Belgium, France, Germany. Um, and I think the one thing that I guess in England, uh, you know, we speak English. You guys talk a little funny. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, um, I don't know, I, I grew up listening to it, and there was a uh, blues and rock and roll, there was a, 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 a truth and a reality and an honesty to the music that was, I think, undeniable, certainly to a young kid growing up in London, and uh, I still listen to the music, so uh, yeah, it's still there with me. Sure. And, and as we wrap up, I know you guys got some great summer shows. We're looking really forward to seeing you out here at the Saban and all the great performances. But we, we can't leave without talking about you know, the man, Lonesome Dave Peverett. I mean, Last Train Home, the blues tribute to Lonesome Dave. You know, you guys are obviously paying tribute to him with Charlie every night. What, what, what can you say about the man, you know, that, that, that gave so much to, to us, so many great memories and – you know the the you know the driving force of Foghat that you guys continue forward on. I was real fortunate to. Uh, I always played in great bands. Um, I always played with all great bass players. Lonesome Dave was real special. Even when he was ill, when he had cancer, when he got on stage, it was nothing less than a hundred and ten percent. That was the beauty of the man, and, uh, uh, and uh, it was incredible to be able to play with him because he never gave it anything other than a full bar. And, and, and in lots of ways, uh, Charlie Hune, our current singer, is uh, similar like that. He loves to play. Uh, and Dave, of course, had uh, great knowledge about all the music. Uh, and uh, yeah, I love the man. I miss him. Um, he died too young. But I'm going to roll till I'm old and roll till I drop. Uh, yeah. At the moment, we're working on uh, a new uh, CD or album, as we like to say. Sure. And uh, I'll do it until I'm pushing out the daisies. Well, you, you've given us so much great music. We, we, we love the band. What, what advice do you give to the young players today? Obviously, the business is constantly evolving. But as a player, creating your own style or having any kind of legacy or longevity that you have, what, what advice do you like to impart on the young bands and players today? Uh, you play because you love music. You play because you love playing. You know, if, uh, you want to earn a living, uh, go where the money is, work in a bank. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, I meet, you know, many, many uh, young musicians out on the road to come to see us. Um, and they uh, and, and a lot of them don't get a chance to sort of play uh, professionally like I do. I mean, I'm real. I'm one of the fortunate ones in this world who gets a really good living um, playing stuff, playing music I really enjoy. So uh, um, practice, 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 and uh, do it because you love to play. And I, I think most musicians who actually sort of get to earn a living and are successful in the music business do it because of that because they have a passion and they they love to play so uh, I mean I often go out and uh, you know play benefits I live on Long Island in New York and um, anybody calls me up and says we, we're doing a benefit for somebody who's probably a little less fortunate than myself so I turn up I just love to play so there's some great players out here so I enjoy it yeah, do it because you love it well, you've certainly inspired us. We love the music, and, and Roger, uh, we can't wait to see Foghat on the road. Thank you so much right. for your time. Best of luck. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure talking to you.